Intel are officially announcing 11th gen Rocket Lake desktop processors today, and many of these new parts are cheaper than AMD's equivalent Ryzen 5000 CPUs. Is it time to get excited about new Intel CPUs? Well, let's find out. Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It feels like with this particular news story that there's not a whole lot to say given the crazy stream of leaked information over the last few months, culminating in actual reviews of retail Core i7 11700K processors before Intel had even officially announced them. A real mess of a launch if I'm honest and likely impacted by delays, but today we are putting the final pieces of the puzzle together on Intel's 11th gen desktop series ahead of reviews later in the month. In the lead up to today's news announcement, Intel had already given quite a bit of information on Rocket Lake. We know the design is still built on their 14 nanometer process. However, it features a new core architecture codenamed Cypress Cove. This is Intel's Ice Lake design, originally destined for 10 nanometer, backported to 14 nanometer, bringing with it up to a 19% IPC improvement compared to Skylake and its derivatives over the last five years. However, it's not the latest core design from Intel, with Tiger Lake, actually on 10 nanometer, using a generation newer architecture in mobile devices. Intel has also previously told us about the Core i9-11900K and the inclusion of a maximum of 8 CPU cores. There's a new XE integrated GPU inside, new AI features, and new platform support through Intel's 500 series motherboards. It really feels like most of this stuff has already been discussed, so let's just cut to the chase of the major announcement today, the full SKU list and pricing. While there are a lot of individual processors listed in this table, far too many in my opinion, the basics of Rocket Lake are split up into three series, Core i9, Core i7, and Core i5 as usual. However, unlike prior generations, there are no Rocket Lake Core i3 models. Intel are instead launching refreshed 10th gen parts at the lower end, which we'll talk about soon. The Core i9 and Core i7 parts are very similar. All pack 8 CPU cores and 16 threads with 16 megabytes of L3 cache. As in prior years, the K models are unlocked SKUs that support overclocking, the F models do not feature integrated graphics, and the T models are low power variants with a 35 watt TDP. The models that do feature an iGPU use a new XE design, although this is being branded as UHD Graphics 750 for some reason. You'll find 32 execution units here with up to a 50% performance boost compared to previous generations according to Intel. With the Core i9 and Core i7 parts using the same basic layout, what separates them? Well, the basic answer here is frequency. The Core i7-11700K and KF are clocked up to 5GHz on a single core and up to 4.6GHz all core. The Core i9-11900K and KF push the single core turbo up to 5.3GHz, but that's with thermal velocity boost, a feature that increases clock speeds when operating temperatures are low, and this feature isn't enabled on the Core i7 parts. Without TVB, the 11900K still tops out at 5.2GHz, so that is still an increase on the 11700K. However, the all core frequency is just 100 megahertz higher at 4.7 gigahertz. The other difference between the Core i9 and Core i7 parts is hidden in the footnotes of the SKU list. The 11900K and KF both operate by default using DDR4 3200 Gear 1, while all the other SKUs, including the Core i7 range, default to DDR4 3200 Gear 2. These gears refer to the frequency ratio between the memory controller and memory itself, which has historically been 1 to 1 on Intel parts. Gear 1 is the usual 1 to 1 ratio, while gear 2 is a 2 to 1 ratio, halving the memory controller frequency. This means that while the unlocked Core i9 processors run at a standard 1 to 1 ratio, the locked Core i9 parts and the Core i7 line all use a slower 2 to 1 configuration by default. This introduces some further differentiation between the Core i7 and i9 parts, as the i7 models will have worse memory performance. You may be familiar with these ratios if you are an AMD Ryzen user, given that the recommendation for those parts as well is to run in a 1 to 1 ratio, rather than pushing memory frequencies higher and falling back to 2 to 1, so it'll be interesting to see how this affects Intel processors. With all that said, motherboard manufacturers are likely to ignore this default recommendation from Intel and run all Rocket Lake processors in gear 1, so a 1 to 1 ratio out of the box. And Nantech confirmed that this was the behavior they saw when testing their retail Core i7-11700K processor. It should run at 2 to 1 going on Intel slides, but the actual default scene in the motherboard was 1 to 1. 
Let's talk pricing for these parts before looking at the Cry 5 line. The most interesting thing here to me is the pricing of the unlocked Cry 7 models. $374 US for the KF and $399 for the KSKU using Intel standard tray pricing model. It should be noted that tray pricing for bulk units is not the same as an MSRP, and typically at launch Intel's parts are sold at 10% above this tray price or thereabouts before falling to or below the listed price in the months after. In any case, what we are looking at is an 8-core, 16-thread Rocket Lake CPU priced around $400, which is undercutting AMD's 8-core Ryzen 7 5800X that retails for $450. There may be some other platform costs to consider here, like the difference in motherboard pricing. However, at first glance, this is an aggressive price point from Intel that should compete strongly with AMD's offering. If these prices are accurate, then Intel could be offering better performance per dollar in the 8-core space, given that early 11700K reviews show it performing close to the level of a 5800X. I should note that SKU for SKU, these Core i7 parts are slightly more expensive than last-gen offerings, about $25 more than the Core i7 10700K and KF going on Intel's trade price. However, these new parts are supposed to be faster, and they're still cheaper than AMD's line right now. What doesn't make anywhere near as much sense is the price of the unlocked Core i9 models. $539 for the 11900K and $513 for the 11900KF represents a massive $140 premium over the Core i7 models for what amounts to a very small frequency bump. The 11900K will end up competing with AMD's Ryzen 7 5900X at around $550, which makes little sense given AMD are offering 12 cores here versus 8 on Intel. And not only that, the 11900K in core-heavy applications is likely to present a performance regression compared to the 10900K given the step back from 10 cores to 8 cores. Intel appear to be purely interested in capturing die-hard enthusiasts and Intel fans with that sort of pricing model, which is in contrast to the 10th gen Core i9 series that did offer decent performance gains over the Core i7s in some workloads. The clear standout in the 11th gen series in my opinion is the Core i7 part. With the Core i5 line, Intel are also looking to be very competitive in the mid-range. All CPUs here are 6 cores with 12 threads, 12 megabytes of L3 cache, and for the parts with an iGPU, the same UHD Graphics 750. The K parts are obviously unlocked, while clock speeds also differ between the tiers. The top-end parts do up to 4.6GHz all-core and 4.9GHz single-core, while a lower-end SKU like the Core i5-11400F does 4.2GHz all-core and 4.4GHz single-core. Pricing is also continuing to undercut AMD. The 11600KF should end up around $260 at retail from a $237 tray price, putting it below AMD's Ryzen 5 5600X at $300, and compared to 10th gen Core i5s, there is no price increase here. But the really compelling products once again appear to be the lower tier parts, especially the Core i5-11400F at a $157 tray price, likely around $170 to $180 at retail. AMD doesn't have anything compelling in this price tier right now, with the Ryzen 5 3600 selling for $200, and even the Ryzen 5 2600 going for $190. With the 11400F using Intel's new Rocket Lake architecture, which should deliver a healthy performance bump, we should have increased competition in the $150 to $200 CPU market, and it will make it harder for AMD to justify selling a 3-year-old CPU at such a high price. We've already been recommending Intel's Core i5 CPUs in this market for several months now, and if there's no change on AMD's side, that's set to continue with Intel about to launch faster models. As for Core i3 and Pentium Gold processors, Intel aren't releasing 11th gen options just yet, instead refreshing their 10th gen Comet Lake offerings. These are basic frequency bumps, so something like the Core i3-10100 is now clocked 100MHz higher and becomes the Core i3-10105 at the same tray price, nothing particularly interesting. Intel has already spent some time previously talking about Rocket Lake's CPU features, so I'll just breeze through this pass in case you missed it. Aside from the new core architecture that we talked about earlier, another major addition is the bump from 16 PCIe 3.0 to 20 PCIe 4.0 lanes from the CPU. This allows you to attach both a Times 16 GPU and a Times 4 SSD directly to the CPU for maximum performance, in contrast to previous designs where M.2 SSDs had to go through the chipset. Intel are also finally coming to the table with PCIe 4.0, bringing feature parity with AMD CPUs. We also get a better media encode decode engine thanks to the upgrade to Gen 12 graphics, and all that comes with it, although this functionality probably won't be available with F-series SKUs given the iGPU is totally disabled. 
11th gen processors support a wide range of improved overclocking features. One of the most interesting ones is real-time memory frequency overclocking, which will allow tweaking memory OCs in Windows through Intel's extreme tuning utility without any restarts. Previously, you'd have to do most of the memory overclocking in the BIOS, so this is a pretty substantial improvement. Intel also provide a wide range of AVX offsets and controls, which is especially useful given these new processors support AVX 512, and overclockers will likely need to set a large offset to get a stable OC. Alongside 11th gen CPUs, we also get 500 series motherboards. Again, we talked about this previously. The main features here are memory overclocking support on H570 and B560 motherboards, a new x8 DMI for double the bandwidth between the CPU and chipset, and full support for PCI 4.0 across the lineup. These boards are backwards compatible with 10th gen processors as well. However, you don't need a 500 series board to use an 11th gen processor, as Rocket Lake is also compatible with some 400 series boards, namely Z490, H470 and Q470. Unfortunately, B460 and H410 boards do not support Rocket Lake as they use a different and incompatible chipset chip. Intel tells us that depending on the motherboard, you may get PCIe 4.0 support and the full 20 CPU lanes of PCIe on 400 series boards with Rocket Lake CPUs, but this will come down to whether the motherboard vendor enables it and their board layout. I'll close out this video today looking at Intel's performance slides, which are not very useful as they are extremely limited in the information shown. And we already have reviews of the Core i7 11700K on the internet if you want to see an independent analysis. Intel is showing us just four games in their gaming comparisons, all benchmarked with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 GPU. While it's nice to have at least some benchmarks, only showing four games is insufficient to get a proper idea of CPU limited gaming performance. In any case, Intel is showing massive performance, which to them means an 8-14% to performance improvement versus the Core i9-10900K in these four games. Up against the Ryzen 5 5900X, Intel also winning in their benchmarks with a 3-11% to lead, and then finally Intel also expect the Core i5-11600K to be faster than the Core i5-10600K by 7-16% to in these four games. Intel's other benchmarks surrounded productivity performance, and like previous Intel presentations, a lot of the focus here was on applications coded to take specific advantage of Intel's accelerators. It's unclear whether, for example, the video creation and ML perf gains shown here versus the 5900X would also apply to the Core i9-11900KF, which does not include the integrated GPU and tends to be a more popular option given it is a bit cheaper. In any case, again, at this point, you could just read an 11700K review and have a pretty good understanding of where productivity performance lies with these processors. So that basically does it for today's video. The only major new information we got here was pricing, which gives context to the performance and specifications we are seeing, but ultimately a lot of the other stuff we already know about, especially performance for the 11700K. These chips are expected to go on sale on March 30th, at least that was the original plan, which is when reviews will also go live for the remaining chips. Anyway, that's it for this video. If you're interested in supporting Hardware Unbox, you can do so via our Patreon and Floatplan accounts. Links to those are both in the description below. I won't make this video any longer than necessary, so thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.